Our next interview will be with Richard Painter, who has written a terrific new book called Taxation Only with Representation. And as part of the book and in our interview today, we're going to get back to one of our favorite topics and your favorite topics, which is campaign finance reform. You may recall last year we had an interview with uh, John Pudner from Take Back Our Republic, and uh, Richard has collaborated with them a bit on the book and to do much stronger messaging, particularly to the conservative base of the political universe, and to you know, hammer on some very specific solution sets that they think will help solve some of these critical issues we have related to campaign finance reform. So again, we welcome today Richard Painter. Richard, how are you today? Very well, thank you very much for inviting me. So I know you have an esteemed background uh, to get you to this issue, but when I was reading your biography, I saw you were uh, the White House ethics officer at one point in time? Yes, from 2005 to 2007. I was the chief ethics lawyer in the uh, White House under President George W. Bush. Uh, you know, uh, people don't always associate ethics in White House and ethics in politics. Um, can you give us a little bit about uh, what that job means and uh, maybe some of the, just a hint at some of the issues you may have faced while you had that job? Well, I dealt with a lot of financial conflicts of interest uh, for uh, not only White House officials, but also the president's nominees uh, to executive branch agencies and also two of the nominees to the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Samuel Alito. I worked with them uh, in the confirmation process. Uh, so uh, financial conflicts of interest are a big part of the picture, uh, but also uh, political uh, activity by executive branch officials uh, in uh, the uh, course of their official duties uh, and the conflicts of interest that can arise uh, when executive branch officials get involved in political fundraisers and other problems. I dealt with all that. And, and, and I know from my personal uh, life that those, those lines, people try to blur those lines as much as they possibly can. So that's, that's got to be tough to kind of get in there and figure out where, where to draw the line, so to speak. Well, absolutely. It's a big challenge. Uh, we uh, have the president and the vice president, of course, run for uh, re-election after four years. Uh, the executive branch officials are involved very much in the political process, uh, but there are boundaries that need to be respected. And that's the job of the ethics lawyer to make sure that uh, people are following the law. So I know part, a vast part of your career it seems have centered around ethics. I know you spent some time at Harvard as well. Is, is the ethics part of your professional focus what got you interested in campaign finance reform or coming at you from another direction? Well, yes, it was ethics. Uh, I realized uh, after I left the White House and uh, uh, sat down to write a book on uh, government ethics back in 2009, uh, I realized that uh, uh, all of the problems in ethics uh, for government uh, officials uh, are going to be very difficult to solve if we don't do something about the role of money in politics. Uh, that that is, uh, as I explained in my last chapter of that book, the elephant and the donkey in the room. We need to deal with the money in politics problem. We're going to have a big battle with respect to every other aspect of government ethics. Well, I, I, I hadn't looked at your other book. I think I'm going to have you back to talk about that issue as well. That's a critical issue. But somewhere along the line, you, you branched over to uh, campaign finance reform. Did you have kind of an aha moment where you, you knew you had to do something? When I was in the White House, uh, I saw that uh, there was a very active uh, political fundraising machine uh, for both political parties. And when there's a Republican president, there's a lot of pressure on executive branch officials to participate in uh, political fundraisers by giving speeches and uh, conducting other activities. And uh, I thought that was a serious problem. I talked to people in the Office of Government Ethics uh, about what had been going on in the Clinton administration, and uh, I found out that that had been a very serious problem under President Clinton, uh, and uh, the problems continued under President Obama. Uh, so we see that regardless of uh, who is in the White House, uh, there is a lot of involvement of executive branch officials in the political fundraising process. And this gives uh, preferential access uh, to uh, the most senior uh, officials in the executive branch, uh, gives the campaign contributors preferential access. And that's, that's wrong. And that's the point I make in the last chapter of my 2009 book, which was called Getting the Government America Deserves. It was published with Oxford University Press. And then I decided uh, to revisit this issue in my latest book, 
and fortunately, Harvard University uh, uh, paid my uh, salary uh, here at the University of Minnesota for the whole year uh, while I went over to Harvard to the Safra Center for Ethics and uh, wrote a book on why political conservatives ought to back campaign finance reform and uh, where I also, in this latest book, suggest a solution that I think political conservatives can back. Yeah, in fact, you have kind of like a subtitle on the cover of the book, The Conservative Conscience and Campaign Finance Reform. So I guess I should ask then, uh, in the context of, of when you say the word conservative, who is the audience for this book? Who, who are you trying to reach? Well, the subtitle there uh, uh, clearly comes out of Barry Goldwater's book, The Conscience of a Conservative, uh, that was published in 1960. And Barry Goldwater in that book and in subsequent speeches in the United States Senate made it clear uh, that he uh, felt strongly that corporate money and union money has no legitimate role in the political campaigns. Uh, and uh, Barry Goldwater also spoke out against the United States uh, Supreme Court uh, and their judicial activism uh, with respect to uh, campaign finance, starting with the Buckley versus Vallejo case. Uh, so there's been long-standing uh, concern in the conservative community uh, I trace it back to Edmund Burke in the 18th century, long-standing concern about the cost of political uh, of, of elections for political office and the corrupting influence of campaign money. In fact, I thought it was very interesting because I've, I've read a lot on campaign finance reform, but the fact that you went back historically to kind of paint a picture, I, I thought was a very interesting exercise. Well, yes, indeed. And Edmund Burke uh, went back even further. He, he found a, a, a lot of detail about uh, what had gone on in the Roman Empire and how the cost of elections and entertaining the electorate uh, had led to the decline of the Republic uh, in Rome. So again, just, but to get back to your particular audience, who, who, who do you want to read this book? Is it like the, the voter on the street, the conservative voter? Is it the conservative office holder? Who, 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 who's this for? I, I think I have arguments in this book that, uh, that just about everybody ought to be interested in. Uh, so I uh, divide the conservative community into different groups because there are many different types of people who uh, would identify themselves as conservative. Uh, for example, I have uh, one quite lengthy chapter on the, the connection between campaign money and big government, uh, excessive government spending on uh, pork barrel projects uh, that are uh, funded uh, at the behest of campaign contributors and earmarks uh, for campaign contributors, uh, for example, solar energy companies that uh, go bankrupt, uh, but there are many, many others uh, that benefit uh, politicians, both Republican and Democrat. So big government spending comes from campaign finance, also excessive and an intricate uh, regulation, overly complex regulation. Uh, we see that the Dodd-Frank Act regulation, regulating financial services was a uh, thousand pages long, and the largest contributors to both Senator Dodd and Congressman Barney Frank were large banks. And it's no surprise that that regulation benefits large banks a lot more than it does small and medium-sized banks that have to deal with the overly complex regulation and cannot take advantage of the loopholes, as well as large banks. Uh, so there's a whole chapter there addressed to conservatives who are concerned about big government. Then I next turn uh, to social conservatives and the uh, fact that social conservatives bring very little money to the table compared with a large corporate interest. And I quote the story from the Gospel of Luke, uh, the story of the widow's might, where the widow is putting a few pennies into the coffers of the temple treasury while the rich men are pouring in much more money. And Jesus makes it clear that the contribution of the poor widow is just as important as everyone else's. And that's the way we ought to be running our democracy. And uh, that's not the way we're running our democracy. And then I go is through issue by issue that social conservatives are worried about. And whether or not I agree with social conservatives on each of these issues, that's not the point. The point is that they don't have a seat at the table in our current system of campaign finance. If a large drug company wants to market a plan B or a plan C or whatever it is, contraceptive or what they call a contraceptive, and they want approval, those drug companies make very, very large campaign contributions 
And when they want FDA approval, they're likely to get it. Social conservatives may have concerns about some of those drugs. How much money are they putting on the table? Not very much. And I think it's pretty clear who's going to win. And then I turn to the gambling industry uh, and the influence of the gambling industry, particularly in my own Republican Party, where some of the largest contributors are casino uh, uh, billionaires. And indeed, we have a presidential candidate who himself has made enormous amounts of money off of casinos. And then I turn to every other issue that social conservatives worry about, school choice. They're up against the teachers' unions with respect to school choice. There's very little money on the other side uh, on that issue. Uh, so on issue after issue, can social conservatives uh, are, uh, are getting whipped uh, in, the, uh, in the political process and money, campaign money, has a large part to do with it. So it's about time the uh, faith-based community, the social conservatives break away uh, from those who oppose campaign finance reform. And last, I uh, turn to uh, national security conservatives, uh, sometimes called neoconservatives. But all of us are concerned about national security, conservative, moderate, liberal. Uh, I don't think any of us want foreign governments, particularly hostile powers, being able to influence United States elections. But the fact of the matter is that corporate wealth is global in our economy. Uh, there's no way we can get around the fact that major corporations have investments abroad, that many American corporations are owned by, controlled by people in other countries, whether it's Europe or whether it's the Middle East or China or Russia or somewhere else. And in a global corporate economy, if we equate corporate ownership and corporate wealth with First Amendment free speech rights, as the Supreme Court does in the Citizens United case, and free speech rights to use corporate money to influence United States elections, we're going to have our Congress, our senators, our representatives chosen by wealthy people in other countries. And that's exactly what we fought against in the American Revolution. The Founding Fathers were worried about this problem a foreign influence over the U.S. government when they drafted the Constitution. And I think it is atrocious to see the Supreme Court uh, interpret that same contribution, the Constitution, in a manner that would allow such easy uh, access to our political system and control over our political system by foreign powers. Now, and I know this point was raised when it was raised by President Obama in one line in the State of the Union. Um, that uh, some of the justices of the Supreme Court uh, were, were somewhat surprised because they had not ruled that foreign money had the right to influence U.S. elections the way domestic corporate money did in the Citizens United case. Uh, but that's an artificial distinction uh, for anybody who understands how corporations work. And uh, while it may, at this point, be the state of the law that foreigners are not allowed to influence U.S. elections by making campaign contributions, uh, those laws are very, very easy to get around. It's like saying with, it's illegal to drink under the age of 21, so there's not going to be any of that going on. Well, we, we know that getting foreign money into a U.S. political campaign right now is a lot easier than getting alcohol into the freshman yard of the typical college campus. Uh, so anybody who's worried about national security um, and uh, the independence, the continuing independence of the United States, uh, needs to be very, very worried about this problem of campaign finance. You know, and, and this was one of the most interesting parts of your book to me, the fact that you come from this from a different perspective. Most of the people are incredibly focused only on Citizens United now. Uh, they're focused on you know, free speech versus corruption. And they, they don't look at the governmental operations side, so to speak, that you're looking at here. And, and you're not necessarily calling it corruption, but I think you're saying that really the, the, the premise of so many aspects of the system just aren't working anymore. Well, that's absolutely right. And uh, I focus on the realities on the ground. I'm not interested in what, what's going on in, the, in the cloud theory land uh, with respect to constitutional interpretation or anything else. It's what's really going on. And the uh, Citizens United case, I call that the non-Citizens United case. Uh, we are going to have a situation where our government is under the control of global corporate wealth. And we need to wake up to the fact that global corporate wealth is no longer exclusively American uh, or even principally American. 
uh, in the 21st century. Uh, and that's the reality. Now, that being said, we can solve this problem without getting into a fight with the Supreme Court. That's not needed. There are solutions to this problem that are uh, consistent with the Citizens United opinion, even though I disagree with that opinion. Uh, we don't need to obsess on uh, changing the composition of the Supreme Court uh, in, order to obsess, in order to address this problem. There are other solutions. Uh, and, and we're going to get to your solutions, but one of the things that I found very striking is um, that the FEC is just like this paper tiger. I don't even know what they do. Well, I don't know what's going on over there either. They can't seem to uh, reach agreement on anything. It's partisan deadlock. And I discussed one of the most notorious cases in my book. Uh, there was a German pornographer who decided that he wanted to throw a whole bunch of money at a, a opposing a Los Angeles County ballot measure. This ballot measure would have required uh, sex workers who are making X-rated movies uh, to wear uh, uh, protective gear, uh, would be the polite way to describe it. Uh, and uh, he opposed this. He thought his workers ought to be able to make these movies uh, uh, without any protection at all, uh, and that the L.A. County ballot measure should be defeated. And he's a foreigner, and he threw into this campaign a lot of money. Well, I thought that it was illegal for foreigners to influence U.S. political campaigns. Well, the Federal Election Commission deadlocked on this, and it was, ironically, the Republicans on the commission who weren't willing to take action. Now, I know that there was some, uh, there's some question about whether ballot measures are subject to the same legal restrictions as uh, campaigns for public office. And so there's some legal technicalities there. But the fact that the Republican members of the commission were unwilling to proceed even with an investigation to find out what had happened um, uh, was, uh, I think, uh, embarrassing. Uh, and embarrassing to me as a Republican. I mean, we got a pornographer, a foreigner, who's trying to influence the political process in the United States, and the Federal Election Commission needs to be there ready to take action. And if there's a legal uh, 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 a gray area well, the courts can sort that out when the FEC brings a case. So, so getting back a, a little bit to what you were talking about before, uh, I think one of the really interesting things you do in the book is you equate I'm gonna, well, big money to big government, and then you equate uh, big money to big spending. And I think you point out it really doesn't matter which party's in control. It's almost like there's too much Kool-Aid there to, uh, to uh, go on a diet. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, we had a very hard time back in uh, uh, the uh, Bush administration reigning in the spending. Uh, and that was when the Republicans controlled both the uh, House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, keeping the spending under control was very, very difficult. There were lots of pork barrel projects. I discussed some of them in the book. Uh, there was a Republican congressman from Alaska who was uh, earmarking money for a uh, inter highway interchange down in Florida. Now, why would a Republican... Congressman Alaska be so concerned about a, uh, pouring federal money into a uh, highway interchange down in Florida. Well, it turned out that he had a campaign contributor who was a real estate man up in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, uh, who uh, owned some property uh, near the proposed interchange and wanted it to be constructed at taxpayer expense. And that's only one of many, many examples. There's a famous bridge to nowhere up in Alaska. Uh, and then there uh, uh, is more recently the uh, Solyndra, the uh, that um, solar energy company that went bankrupt. Uh, there is example after example. Of course, the Defense Department budget is bloated uh, with uh, projects that aren't necessarily uh, in the national interest, but are there for campaign contributors. And this should be offensive to anybody who cares about good government. Have any of these arguments been made to the court? I know the court focuses on corruption. But have, has this been part of the discussion in any of the court cases, this overlap of what you're talking about? Uh, there's some discussion of it, some of the briefs uh, in the court cases. Uh, so there, there is some discussion here and there. Uh, the problem is I, I think the courts, uh, in interpreting the Constitution, have a very rigid idea of what's First Amendment uh, protected free speech. And the note, once you open up the... Uh, notion that corporate money can flow into these secret organizations, these 501c4 organizations, for the purpose of electioneering communications, and that that's somehow free speech. Uh, and, and once the Supreme Court says that, uh, we are in a very difficult situation trying to back off of that 
uh, without um, uh, some change of the composition of the Supreme Court. But as I pointed out in the book, there are other solutions, and we can get around the Supreme Court um, if they don't want to work with us to solve this problem. In fact, uh, that's a good segue. I'd like to talk about the solutions because I don't want to run out of time. Maybe what the best thing to do is why don't you give us an overview of your entire solution set, and then we'll try and drill down one by one, time permitting, and get through as many as we can. Well, the centerpiece of my solution um, uh, set here is the uh, taxation only with representation uh, provision that could be a constitutional amendment, either to the federal constitution or a state constitution, or it could be a statute, federal statute or state statute. Uh, and uh, the, the core language is this, that the government shall have no right to tax any United States citizen in any way, and that includes income tax, sales tax, inheritance tax, property tax, or any other tax, unless that citizen has been given the opportunity to allocate $200 per year of his or her tax money for the support of a candidate for elected office of his or her choice. And uh, that should be a constant item by view. Uh, but as I say, we, we don't want to go through the process of amending the Constitution. We can simply put that in an act of Congress or in the uh, acts passed by the state legislature that could at least restrict the taxing authority of the state and local governments unless and until the individuals have been the, had the right to have the first $200 of their tax money go to the citizen having a meaningful voice in choosing the elected officials who are going to be in charge of spending or wasting or whatever they do with the rest. Uh, but that, that is taxation only with representation. If I don't have a meaningful role in choosing the elected officials who are spending my tax money, I shouldn't have to pay the taxes. And I think you, you're, you project that this plan would produce $8 billion at the federal level? If we did this at the federal level, uh, I think uh, it would be approximately $8 billion. It would all depend on how many people chose to participate. Uh, and uh, the taxpayer, of course, would not pay any additional taxes by choosing to participate. Uh, but uh, what I would envision is the taxpayer being able to go online with their Social Security number or some other password and allocate the money uh, to a candidate of his or her choice. Uh, and um, uh, depending on how many people participated, it would be approximately eight billion dollars, uh, but uh, that, that, that's a rough estimate. It would be enough money uh, to assure that politicians aren't dependent on big donors uh, for election to public office. Now, we still have the big donors in there to some extent, although I think there'd be less incentive for the big donors to be uh, uh, pumping money into political campaigns because they wouldn't get as much influence. Uh, politicians uh, could uh, raise enough from small donors, from taxpayers and other small dollar donors uh, to run for public office uh, and to beat the special interests. Now, um, this is a sp kind of a spin on ideas other people have put on the table. Uh, you point out Professor Lessig wants to have vouchers. I think in some municipalities they have similar uh, concepts. W what is unique about yours and why do you think the particular element of the tax credit, the way you did it, do it, is so important compared to some of what the others want to do. Yes, and we indeed do have uh, in some states, uh, Oregon uh, has a tax credit. The problem is they phase it out uh, for upper income individuals. Uh, Minnesota for quite a while had a $40 tax credit uh, or something like that, but then the legislature decided there was too tight a budget uh, and decided to pull it out. I think that was a big mistake. Uh, one of the points I make in the book is that our current system campaign finance and dependency upon big donors bloats the budget because of the amount of park bio projects that legislators need to vote for in order to attract campaign contributions. And so this is a, a, a proposal that I think would, uh, would reduce the size of the budget overall. Uh, so this has been tried in a, in a number of states, not very many. Um, and uh, it, some of the other people have written about it talk about vouchers and and other ideas. Uh, my point is this is not a government handout. This is not even a voucher. This is my money. I'm a taxpayer and I'm writing a big check to them at the end of the week. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, out of that money, I'm entitled to $200 to 
to go toward my having a meaningful role in choosing the members of Congress, the uh, senators, or others who are going to have a significant influence over how the rest of that money is spent. And that's my right. It's my money. It's not the government's money. It's not a government program. It's not even a government voucher. It's not like food stamps. That's not the point. It's my money. And I'm entitled to use the first $200 in that way, or I shouldn't have to send them the rest. Now, um, and what is an interesting twist on a concept, you talk about the need for transparency as part of this overall solution set, yet you want to have the small donors being excluded from the transparency process up to like 1000 or even $5,000. I, I do think that we uh, uh, should think seriously about uh, raising the um, amount that um, the threshold for uh, disclosure uh, certainly 250 is too low. Uh, and the reason is that someone should be able to, if they feel strongly they support a candidate uh, for public office and they have three or $400, 500 uh, be able to support that person without their employer finding out or their neighbors. Uh, and uh, when we don't protect privacy of the small donors, we discourage the smaller donors. And then what's going on with respect to the big donors a lot of them are funneling the money into these 501c4 organizations uh, where nobody knows who's funding it. Uh, and so there's uh, lots of privacy uh, on that end of the spectrum where millions of dollars is, uh, is, is slushing around there. So uh, one thing I, I think that for small donors, uh, and we could discuss where, what that threshold ought to be, and I think it could be different for federal elections and for state elections, um, and it might be different in different states. Uh, that uh, we might extend somewhat more privacy to the, to the smaller donors. Uh, we're not going to have time at all to talk about the media today. and You do deal with the media in your book, and I, maybe I want to have you back to have this conversation. But I know we, under these PACs, are protected. You can't see who the donors are. I'm wondering if we could make a link to media. In other words, the media gets licensed by government. Could, could we somehow make it so that before you, they could run an ad on TV or have access to the, you know, the public airways? then they would have to disclose who's paying for the ads. Well, we could think about that. The problem uh, when you get into that, um, uh, you do run into First Amendment issues. Uh, whenever you put the government in charge of controlling access uh, uh, to the airways or the media, uh, and that's a road that a lot of people, a lot of civil libertarians are not necessarily going to want to go down. Uh, I think the more constructive role is to focus on the money and the cash flows uh, and money coming from corporate entities. These corporations uh, have shareholders. I'm shocked that the, uh, the Senate and the House don't seem to want to let the Securities Exchange Commission even think about disclosure requirements for 1934 registered companies. Uh, and I, you know, I don't think large amounts of money moving around the financial system has a privacy right. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, that needs to be disclosed uh, when that money is going to be used to influence U.S. elections. Uh, trying to control um, uh, access to the airwaves uh, is something that uh, a, a lot of, uh, as I say, civil libertarians are going to be uncomfortable with. So we had John Pudner on the show. We're having you today talking about your book. I, I know John is everywhere. I, he, he must be triplets. And I know you've been around the country quite a bit since you, you published your book. What's your reaction so far? Well, I think we've had a very positive reception. Uh, the national security concerns uh, are getting a lot of traction. I was on a program with John uh, about a year ago over at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., and we had there the former um, chairman of the Federal Election Commission, Trevor Potter, uh, the current chair, then current chair, Ann Ravel, and quite a few people in the audience. And I believe USA Today came over there, and I don't recall what they wrote about it, but there was one other newspaper, and it was Sputnik, uh, the Russian paper. And uh, they had that up the next day in Russian and in English, talking about how uh, foreign money can get into U.S. political campaigns. So I'm sure President Putin was reading that. First, first thing was morning cup of coffee. Uh, this is a serious issue. Uh, it's recognized now. I think it's a serious issue. It's worth a lot more than just one line in the State of the Union speech president. I have talked about it over at a meeting at the White House. Uh, I think that uh, the uh, there are a lot of people in the national security community who are very concerned about the uh, potential influence of foreign powers 
uh, over United States elections through sovereign wealth funds and other avenues. So uh, I've got a lot of traction on that. Social conservatives are starting to come around uh, to realizing that this stack, uh, deck is, is not stacked in their favor. Uh, and uh, I think that small government conservatives are worried too. So I, uh, I've had a lot of very positive reaction to the book and a lot of, I see a lot of concern about campaign finance. Well, I applaud you on your work. For my viewers, if they want to get the book or drill down a little more deeper and find out what you're doing and, and get more active in this concept, how do they find you? How do they find the book? Where do they go to next? Well, the book is available on uh, Amazon.com. Uh, it is Taxation Only with Representation, The Conservative Conscience and Campaign Finance Reform. Uh, it is also available from Take Back Our Republic, uh, which is a publisher. That is a campaign finance reform group uh, consisting uh, principally of political conservatives who want to see campaign finance reform. Uh, the book is also available to subscribers of the uh, SSRN Social Science Research Network. Uh, it's available free of charge there and can be downloaded. Uh, and anybody who's interested in the book can also email me, uh, Richard Painter, at the University of Minnesota Law School, and I would uh, make sure you can get a copy. Well, Richard, we wish you well. You've done a, a very interesting book here. I recommend it to my viewers. I, I told you I'm going to write a piece on it, get it on my website, and obviously this, this video will run. And maybe we can get you back uh, in a year or two and, and catch up and see where you've gone and what further success you've had. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Have a great day.